Good morning. We will be reading from Matthew chapter 6 today, and we're going to be starting in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then jump down to verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the, grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Good morning. So good to see you this morning and good to be together. Uh, what, a, what a joy to be able to sing the truths of our God. And uh, I want to just express my appreciation to those of you that have been praying for my, my health. Um, I've been teaching on healing and uh, God's been putting me to the test. And I want to assure you guys, I am not standing up here as your pastor because I got this all together. Uh, I am learning, and it's, it is a challenge to reconcile God's gift of medical doctors and medicine and his role as our physician and our healer. And... Uh, He's a little bit, you, you read about the, the miracles where he instantly heals, and then there's other times where you're on the slow track. And uh, this, this last week, I had approached the elders and asked them to anoint me with oil and pray. Uh, it's, it's some nasal sinus infection and, and affecting my, my lungs, and uh, so they prayed over me. I had earlier in that day made an appointment to see my doctor, uh, which wasn't going to be till Friday. And so it was Tuesday, the elders prayed for me, and just very gradually, I think maybe it's getting better, not dramatically for sure. Um, Friday came, I went for my appointment, he gave me a prescription, I went and got it filled, took the prescription, and I've had two absolutely sleepless nights since then. <laughs> and so, okay, Lord, talk to me. <laughs> I, I have to confess, I'm not sure how to sort all this out and how we reconcile. Uh, he's the giver of all gifts, good and perfect. And the good gift is medical profession. The perfect gift is divine healing. 
And, and so I'm on a journey, and I thank you who are praying with me uh, along the way, and I'll keep you posted. But I, I sense God's enabling grace this morning, and uh, let's just bow our hearts in prayer before we look at Matthew chapter 10. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your grace is not dependent upon our getting it all together. It's not dependent upon us doing it right or even knowing it and understanding it. But Lord, you bless the undeserving, you bless the unworthy, you save the undeserving, you save the unworthy. And I thank you that you are long-suffering towards us and you are abounding in mercy, not treating us according to what our sin deserves. But Lord, you are a patient father. And I pray for us as a congregation that we would learn these things that you are teaching us um, from your word, some that we confess we have not been trusting, we have not been practicing, and now we don't know how to. And we ask you to teach us. And we ask that you would cause us to grow and to mature, and that we would encourage one another, build one another up, support one another in, in this walk and in this journey of faith. And Lord, as we look into your word this morning, again, there's difficult things here that we so often have failed to practice, and we're in a place where we confess we don't even know how to do this. It sounds simple, but Lord, it's tough. And we ask you to teach us, and we ask you to shape us and conform us to the likeness of Jesus Christ, that the things that we're studying in the Bible wouldn't just be um, unique, and that wouldn't be just things that are written on pages here, but Lord, I pray that what is written in your word be, would become our normal experience, that it would be worked out in our lives. Conform us to the likeness of Jesus Christ, we pray. And I ask for that enabling, that unction of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So Matthew chapter 10, we're going to look this morning, verses 9 to 15, and uh, I've titled it, Living Without Money or Possessions. Can you imagine that? <laughs> inconceivable for many of us in the, the West. Have you ever noticed that there's a big difference between the way the Old Testament and the New Testament view money and possessions? If you fail to recognize that there is a difference between them, you will have a difficult time understanding from the Bible how the Lord wants you to handle money and possessions. In the Old Testament... And it's different than the New Testament on this topic. It's very different. In the Old Testament, the focus throughout the Old Testament was on the promised land, on building a nation, establishing a political kingdom with cities and houses and lands and cultivating fields and flocks and herds and, and vineyards and defending it all with armies. In the Old Testament, even the temple of God was a very elaborate physical structure covered with gold. And therefore, because they were building a physical kingdom, material riches were a sign of God's blessing and were important for the task of building the empire. And the great men and women of the Bible usually became wealthy as a result of their walk of faith. Think about it. Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, or Ruth, and David, Solomon, Daniel, Esther. But then you get to the New Testament, and even though Jesus began by offering the kingdom, most of the time that he is teaching, he is actually preparing his disciples for living in the church age an age which was not focused on the land, was not focused on building a nation. And the New Testament temple of God is not an elaborate building. 
made with hands, but we, the people, are now the temple of God, and we're described as a cracked earthen vessel containing the treasure of God's Spirit. But unlike a kingdom, the church has no armies for expansion or defense, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our warfare is spiritual. Instead, the focus of the church in the New Testament is on making disciples and building a community of people known as the body of Christ who are without a land, but instead are described as pilgrims and foreigners just passing through this world on mission. And the New Testament does not equate accumulating treasures on earth with God's blessing, but Jesus has a new message. He says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. He says, woe to the rich and blessed are the poor. And he calls his followers to lay up treasures in heaven by giving away our earthly riches. And he says how hard it is for the rich to enter the, pil the, the kingdom of God. And therefore, Jesus establishes a totally different economy for the church, for his followers, uh, than what you find in the Old Testament kingdom era. Because he's not establishing his kingdom now, instead he is building his church. And those Christians who don't understand this difference think that they are building the kingdom on earth now. And therefore, like the Old Testament Jews, they pursue material riches on earth. And so today we're going to see some teaching of Jesus that... Uh, for his disciples, and as, as his teaching continues, it becomes evident with them that, that they're having a hard time wrapping their minds around this new concept because they're very much rooted in, in the Old Testament kingdom era. As we saw in our study in the first eight verses of this chapter, chapter 10, Jesus was commissioning his 12 disciples to go on a short-term mission, preaching and healing. And we read in verse 5, These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now, as we saw last week, except for verses 5 to 8, most of this teaching uh, still applies to us today as we continue to carry out the Great Commission. And so this is where we left off last week, verse 8. So let's continue reading what further instruction Jesus gave and recognize that most of this is applicable to us today. Verse 9. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. So he's He's preparing them to send them out on this short-term mission. They're going from city to city to city to city in the area, uh, proclaiming the kingdom of God. And he says, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts. Gold, silver, and copper were the, what their money was made out of. Uh, in our culture, gold... Maybe the equivalent might be bringing along your credit card or debit card for uh, those larger purchases. Silver and copper would be uh, cash in a wallet or a purchase or a purse. Uh, Jesus was saying that on this mission, they were to take no money with them, not even some copper, not even small change to buy a, a drink or a light snack along the way. They were to take no money. The bag for your journey... And they weren't to, to take a bag along, would be equivalent to a suitcase or a backpack. Uh, they weren't to bring along any provisions, no extra change of clothes, no sandals as a backup, nor any other gear. 
but they were to travel light only with the clothes on their back. Why? Why is he giving them this instruction? The last line of verse 10 says, For a worker is worthy of his food. This means that in return for their service on mission, their basic needs would be provided for them. Uh, You're going on this mission. I'm sending you on this mission. You're going to be taken care of, Jesus says. Don't worry about it. But remember that in verse 8, Jesus says they can't charge money from those that are receiving their services. You don't take any money with you, and you can't charge the people for your services. Now in verse 9, Uh, They can't bring any supplies along with them. Can't take snack with you. Uh, So how is this going to work? We need to keep in mind that Jesus is training his disciples. This is an assignment. This is uh, a homework assignment. This is part of your learning process. There's something in this that you need to learn. And Jesus' disciples had to learn to live simply They had to learn to put no confidence in their own ability to provide, but they were to depend 100% on the Lord to provide all that they needed while on their mission. And Jesus had taught this way of living in the Sermon on the Mount, but now, because they've never lived this way, this is foreign to them, now they were being given an assignment that would force them to put it into practice. Matthew chapter 6, look back at some of the things he said in the Sermon on the Mount that he is now going to be requiring them to implement. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, they were taught to pray like this, give us this day our daily bread. So, Trust me, Jesus says. Go without any way of providing for yourself and trust me to provide. Trust your Father to provide. In Matthew 6, verse 24, Jesus taught them, no one can serve two masters. Uh, You cannot serve God and mammon or God and money, riches. And so the disciples were to take nothing with them, no money with them, and they would now learn through this mission to depend on God to be their need meter rather than to depend on money to meet their needs. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, Jesus had taught the disciples, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. Now you can imagine, they're going to be thinking that. He's sending us off with nothing. Um, we're going to be gone for days. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Um, Hopefully they they were wearing something. But (laughs) verse 32 goes on to say, For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And now they're given this assignment It's going to require them to put into practice. It's it's easy when you're just sitting in the classroom, you're being taught that to just nod. And yeah, that's great. That sounds really good. And he says, okay, now go out, take nothing with you. You're going among strangers. Uh, You're going to be gone for days and trust God to provide. And oh man, (laughs) it sounded easy in class. Now this is sounding hard. And... We need to ask ourselves, put ourselves into their position. Have we learned through experience that we can totally trust the Lord to meet our needs? Even when we have no money, even when we have no income. If you haven't learned that lesson, you can be sure the Lord will teach you. We'll give you the opportunity to learn it. They were also being taught the principle of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14, which says those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel, not by charging anything for their ministry, um, but by trusting the Lord to provide. They were also being taught to live simply. As Paul would later teach 
the young men that he was training. For example, 1 Timothy chapter 6, or 6 to 8, where he says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. So the disciples are being given an opportunity to learn some of these things by experience. And again, look in chapter 10 at how Jesus is preparing his disciples for success on the mission. Verse 9, he said, Provide neither gold nor silver, nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. One of the most practical things that we can do to prepare for whatever challenges may come in our mission ahead is to begin asking God to simplify our lifestyle. For example, to pray, Lord, teach me to live like this world is not my home. Cause my heart and my treasure to be securely in the kingdom of God. Teach me to live like I am just passing through here, living lightly, so that I can maximize what I am able to pour into the mission, that I might throw off everything that hinders as I run with perseverance the race marked out for me. Teach me to live like I am not attached to this world. Deliver me from living like this world is my life. Deliver me from living like I'm here for the long haul. Rescue me from trying to suck as much as I can out of this world and instead cause me to pour into this world as much of your grace as you will give me. Lord, convict me and rescue me when I am tempted to think that most of what has been placed into my hands is for me to use selfishly for my own pleasures. But instead, cause me to recognize daily that most of what you entrust to me as a steward is meant to be given for the furthering of the mission, not kept for myself. When we compare Jesus' teaching here with what other New Testament scriptures teach, we realize that some of his teaching, some of his assignment on this mission um, were not absolute principles to always be followed, and some of what he's teaching them were absolute principles. The absolute principles to always be applied were living simply, Depending upon God to meet our needs, never charging a fee for the gospel. These principles, for example, are consistently taught all throughout the New Testament. However, some of Jesus' instructions here were specific for this assignment and not necessarily uh, universal principles to always be followed. For example, though there will be times when the Lord asks us still today to exactly what he asked of his disciples to do here in chapter 10, Jesus was not teaching that his disciples should never use their own money or that his disciples should never take along a backpack or a suitcase with supplies for the mission. And we know this, that this wasn't an absolute that should always be followed because later, if you look to Luke chapter 22, on the day before Jesus' crucifixion, he gave his disciples opposite instructions. Luke chapter 22. And he referred them back to this event, their first mission. Verse, uh, Luke 22, verse 35. Now, Jesus said to his disciples, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? And so they said, Nothing. It worked. They'd gone out with nothing, and everything they needed had been provided. But note verse 36. Then he said to them, But now, he who has a money bag, let him take it. 
and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So there's a lot going on there, but we recognize we are not simply to follow the way the Lord led someone else to carry out a particular mission, and that's the way we always do it. Nor are we to always do every assignment the same way that the Lord led us to do it in the past. So each assignment might have different details, so we need to learn to be led by the Spirit of God. For example, the Apostle Paul was usually supported by other believers in his ministry. But when that support wasn't there, he worked with his own hands, making and selling tents to provide for his needs so that he could always give the gospel free without charge. So you got an absolute principle. You always give it free without charge. Uh, Sometimes others are going to provide for you. Sometimes you provide for yourself. So, here in this assignment, chapter 10 in Matthew, they're being sent out for several days on this ministry tour. If they had no money for hotels, no money for restaurants, where were they going to sleep and where were they going to eat on their mission? Uh, They're not going to relatives' homes. They're going out among strangers. Look at what's next. Uh, In verse 11, they were to to trust that the Lord would connect them with people whose hearts he had already prepared to support them in all the towns and cities where he was sending them. Look what it says, verse 11. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. Now, the implication is that there's going to be people out there who, whose house you can stay in. There's going to be people out there whose hearts have been prepared by God to receive you. Who are the worthy people? Inquire who in, in that town is worthy and stay with them. Who's, who's the worthy people? The only thing that makes anyone worthy is having humble faith in Jesus Christ. And so in this context, their mission is to proclaim the kingdom, that Jesus has come, the Messiah, he's offering the the kingdom, the kingdom is at hand. Who are the worthy people? In this context, a worthy person refers to anyone who was open to the message that the kingdom was at hand, open to the message that Jesus was the king, and who was willing to receive a representative of Jesus into their home. They believe the message. They're worthy of the kingdom. They may never have heard the gospel before, but when they do hear it, they are open and receptive. Look, for example, in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. I'm going to look at verses 14 and 15. Lydia was a woman who lived in Philippi, and she is an example of what Jesus is teaching his disciples to expect when they go on mission. Verse 14, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God, and the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, or in other words, if you have judged me to be worthy, come to my house and stay. Uh, But the Lord had opened her heart. And so not only had the Lord opened her heart to believe their message, but he had prepared her heart to want them to stay as guests in her house. In fact, she begged them to stay with her. Look to the end of the chapter that we are studying, Matthew chapter 10. Uh, 
You get to the end of the chapter, and Jesus concludes uh, his mission instruction. In Matthew 10, verse 40, he says, He who receives you receives me. Interesting. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. And he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. That's important. Catch this. What's he saying there? He who receives a prophet, I'm sending you guys out as prophets. You've got a message to proclaim. You're calling people to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You're going out as prophets. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, meaning the one who opens their house to a prophet, invites the prophet in and feeds the prophet, is making an equal contribution to the ministry and will get the same reward as the prophet gets. The one proclaiming the message and the one supporting the proclaimer get the same reward. And he goes on to say, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So notice that in carrying out our gospel mission, the Great Commission in our case, not everyone has the same task. Not everyone is an evangelist. Not everyone is a preacher, but everyone has an important part to play in this great commission. The 12 who went with nothing couldn't do their job without the help of those who had something to share with them. On this mission, there were 12 who were sent preaching and healing, but everywhere they went, the Lord had arranged and prepared other believers who had houses, who had food, who had supplies to share with the 12. And they get the same reward as the 12 who are going with the mission message. Look to Romans chapter 12. Just past Acts, where we were a moment ago, into Romans chapter 12. In verse 6, I'll read this from the, the NIV. Um, it's just got some, some clarity here, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but verse 6, for just as each of us has one body with many members, so one body, got eyes and nose and ears and fingers and toes, we've got many members, part of the one body, um, and these members do not all have the same function. Verse 5, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. That's important. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not my own Leave me alone, leave my stuff alone. No, we belong to each other. We're part of the body. Verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. An example of serving is open up your home to host the disciples who are preaching. They're using their gift to proclaim preaching. You use your gift, open up your home and feed them. If your gift is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. And feeding others is a form of giving. And uh, grocery prices today, it can be a generous form of giving. But it's, if that's your gift, use it. If your gift is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. God has given each of us a part. And what are all these gifts for? These gifts are all to be used in the Great Commission. And that's important for us to recognize. Not all are evangelists. Not all are the mouthpieces. 
but we all have something to contribute. And, and Jesus is describing here in Matthew chapter 10 um, how you guys go out with a message. You're going to encounter people that I've prepared and I have gifted, and they're going to come alongside. They're going to contribute. They're going to help enable this ministry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we've looked at, at this last week. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, talking about spiritual gifts. God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets. So these are the ones that Jesus is sending out, his disciples, third teachers, and after that, miracles, then gifts of healings. We looked at that last week, but we'll notice the next one, helps. Gift of helps. The gift of helps includes opening up your homes and providing meals, supplying transportation, providing the things that are necessary for those with the gift of, of preaching and evangelism and those who are going, you're, you're supporting them. In carrying out the Great Commission, those who open their homes and those who provide meals so that those who are preaching and teaching and, and those who are healing can carry out their roles are all making sacrifices. Everybody makes a sacrifice. Everybody makes a contribution. They are all living more simply to enable them to do their part in this ministry. And though they each have different tasks, they are all equally carrying out the mission, and they will all share equally in the reward. Some give up their jobs so that they can go preaching and teaching. Uh, thank you, Caitlin, and others. <laughs> give up your jobs to go and do the preaching, the teaching. Others keep their jobs and live on a reduced budget so that they can maximize their income that is available to support those who are going. And others give up the privacy of their homes to accommodate and provide hospitality to those who are sent. Now, there's an application that we can see uh, possibly coming upon us in our society in, in the near future. We may be entering into a time here in Canada in which those who speak out the truth of God may lose their jobs and lose their homes for the sake of the gospel, and they may need someone else to invite them into their home and provide meals. Such bold witnesses who have spoken out and lost their jobs and therefore lost their homes, are persecuted, they will be richly rewarded by the Lord. But so will the one who opens their home be equally rewarded. As Matthew 10, 41 says, He who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Look to Matthew chapter 25. And here Jesus describes what's going to happen when he returns to judge this world and to set up his kingdom. Matthew chapter 25, beginning to read in verse 34. Then the king, that's Jesus, when he returns, he's returning as king, then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? I don't remember that, Lord. When did that happen? 
And verse 40, and the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. This is part of what Jesus is referring to in the next verses. There is a great spiritual blessing that comes to those who open their homes to the disciples who are sent out on mission. But to those who do not open their hearts and do not open their homes, who do not receive the disciples who are coming to them in the name of Jesus, there is tremendous loss. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 12. We'll carry on. And when you go into a household, greet it. And if the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. Uh, if, if they receive the message, if they believe the message, if they receive you and invite you in because you are coming in my name, let your peace come upon it. Now this peace is similar to the Hebrew shalom, meaning more than just freedom from strife and conflict, but also prosperity, security, and happiness. It's blessing is going to come upon that home. Reward is going to come upon that home. But if it is not worthy, if they will not receive you, if they reject the message, let your peace return to you. Verse 14, and whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, and not everyone is going to receive you or your gospel message. And he's going to get into that in verse 16 to 26. There's going to be opposition in your, in your ministry. But whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Wow. <laughs> that is a pretty heavy-duty threat. To shake off the dust from your feet was an act that symbolized a severance of relationship, a severance of responsibility. It was the, the opposite of sharing in another's reward. I've got nothing to do with you. You've got nothing. You're not sharing in my reward. <laughs> there's no sharing. There's, there's no blessing that's coming to you. It's like washing your hands of a situation. It's indicated I have no responsibility for what happens to you. And I will not share in the guilt of judgment that comes upon you. You are on your own. That's what it meant to shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that home or you leave that town that has rejected your message. This is a, a very serious and ominous gesture being instructed by Jesus. And it is an action with meaning similar to Jesus' words in Matthew 7, 23, where he said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. For Jesus to give this instruction to shake off the dust of that place um, from the disciples' feet as they leave indicated that the people of that house or that city, because they rejected the message of Jesus, because they rejected the gospel of the kingdom, because they refused to receive his disciples who came in his name, they would be considered by God as outside the kingdom, disqualified from his blessings, and condemned to face his judgment and wrath. The parallel to verses 14 and 15 is found back in Matthew chapter 25, where we were just a minute ago. Jesus gave the blessings to those who had given uh, a water and food and, and cared for those who came, in, uh, the, the least among them. But look at what he says next in Matthew 25, verse 41. Then the king will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. 
I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So there's a lot at stake in how they respond to the message that they are proclaiming. There are only two options. Eternal life in the kingdom of heaven or everlasting punishment in hell. And what every person will experience is determined by how they respond to whatever encounter God has given them with Jesus or his gospel. And as much as you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. As much as you did not do it unto the least of these, you did not do it to me. And we don't want to oversimplify this, but there's some insight in here into, well, what about those who never heard the gospel? And as much as you did it unto the least of these. And we are all called to simplify our lifestyle for the sake of being able to give more fully of ourselves and of our time and of our possessions to the mission, recognizing it's not mine, I am a steward, it's all his. And we are not building a kingdom, but Jesus is using us to make disciples. And when called to do this by the Lord, we need to be willing to go without money, without possessions, trusting that the Lord will move the hearts of others to provide for our needs and to recognize it is a weighty message. It is a life-changing gospel. The eternal destiny of many out there is dependent upon what they do with what we present when we come to them in the name of Jesus Christ. So Heavenly Father, we ask you again, as at the beginning, to change our hearts and align us and align our thinking and align our wills and our acting with your word and with your will. And Lord, we confess that we can't do this on our own. But we thank you for the grace of God. We thank you that you enable us and that you empower us for the mission that you call us to. For it's your work. Jesus, you said you would build your church. And the battle is yours, Lord. We go, but you through us fight, and you enable us. Lord, what do we have to offer? What do we have to give? You supply it all, and we trust you. And Lord, increase our faith and deliver us from seeking to find our joy, our pleasure, our fulfillment, our purpose in any of the stuff of the world. But Lord, may we fix our eyes on Jesus and run the race that you've marked out for us. Run with perseverance. Lord, we depend on you for the enabling to run and to continue right to the end. And so we ask these things, Lord, that we might be who you've called us to be. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.